Hi everyone and welcome to the Avid CNC live stream. I'm Sammy and I'm joined by my co-host Corey and today we're going to be talking all about CNC spoil boards and how to figure out which features are right for you. So uh, if you're joining us live here in the chat, please let us know uh, how our sand is and all of that. Um, if you have questions throughout, feel free to drop them in the chat and we're uh, excited for you to join us. Let us know where you're tuning in from. And um, yeah, I'm excited about this. Corey, how do you feel about uh, spoil boards? Yeah, I, uh, CNC machines are so versatile, right? When we talk about all of the different types of applications they can be applied, uh, uh, and spoil boards are a huge part of that because work holding with subtractive manufacturing is really important. And so I'm really excited to talk about some of the different styles of spoil boards that uh, really you know, lend to certain types of manufacturing processes that a CNC machine is great for uh, adding efficiencies to. Right. And CNC, you know, spoil boards are not one size fits all the magic, perfect uh, application for everyone's workflow. So it, it really is, um, it can be an intimidating project, especially when you're getting started, because it lays the foundation of so much of the work that you're going to going to do. It di dictates the possibilities of work holding and how you can approach machining things. So it can be intimidating. Uh, decision or series of decisions. So we're going to try to break those down and make it a little bit more accessible for you. Um, all right. Well, thanks everyone who's tuning in. All right. Let's just go ahead and uh, jump into talking about what uh, the different sections we're going to be focusing on. So first we're going to focus on uh, temporary spoil boards and why you might use a temporary spoil board and uh, how to approach that. We'll also go into common spoil board features, so the material type, um, different work holding options, and all of the, uh, yeah, the, the common things you might reach for, right? Uh, we'll also go over the Avid CNC spoil board project files, and then we're going to focus on uh, some of the experts in the field and the decisions they made and why they made those particular choices, right? All right. Awesome. Well, it seems like we got some good folks joining us. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, I really like to think about CNC as kind of three distinct steps, Sammy. We have the design step, we have the toolpath creation step, and then we have the operator step. And when we talk about spoil board options, I really feel like it's kind of, it can facilitate the uh, uh, toolpath creation and operator steps really well if we have predictable work holding, predictable spoil boards or, or variables in these areas and how we want to accomplish creating those toolpaths. Right. Okay, so let's uh, first jump into talking about uh, what is the function of a spoil board? So what is it supposed to do for us? And it's a really kind of, you know, as we were saying, it's a choose your own adventure kind of thing. It's really anything you want it to be. So it can be a surface to attach your material to. Uh, it can function as a spoil board, right? You can spoil the surface, cut into it purposefully or accidentally, and it will help protect your bits or uh, your workpiece from tear out mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, so the... Uh, ways you can approach that are uh, a variety of ways and how you think about what you want your spoil board to do for you, right? Yeah, I think the name is also kind of, you know, some people call it spoil board, some people call it a waste board, right? When we talk about what that name even means, it means like, hey, this is a sacrificial uh, uh, material that isn't necessarily going to damage our tooling, as you mentioned, and, you know, is kind of intended for us to cut into. Right. Okay, so let's uh, first talk about the temporary spoil board and why we might want a temporary spoil board, at least at first. Um, this can kind of uh, give us the opportunity to uh, make a few successful cuts prior to having to make all of these, you know, big decisions because a spoil board is a simple, can be a simple project but it can also be a large scale project because it can be a heavy material. It can be expensive material. It just it can be a large, the scale makes it a little bit more of a difficult barrier to entry, at least at first. So the temporary spoil board, we're going to talk about why, why you might use that. 
Um, the first might be is uh, squaring up your machine as well as to tram your spindle. That's a very common uh, first approach for that. Um, and then also just gives you confidence for yeah, having a few successful cuts before here, jumping into this uh, large sheet of material, right? Yeah, I think that the tool paths themselves aren't that challenging with spoil board when we talk about creating counter bores and that type of stuff. But when you're creating tool paths that literally use every inch of travel of your machine, that's where a spoil board project really has a layer of complexity that, you know, we really want to iron out before we jump into. Right. So what are the uh, kind of different ways we can make a spoil board? Uh, we have uh, clamps as an option. Um, we could use double-sided tape. That's a really quick and easy option as well. And we also have a slightly uh, more advanced uh, two by fours bolted to your frame uh, technique that was pioneered by uh, Jay Bates. So we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. But first let's talk about how you might clamp a scrap piece of MDF or plywood to your cross members um, just so you can make some initial cuts. So we just have like a little uh, video here clipped together for you. So using clamps um, can be a really easy way to do it. So all you have to do is place your MDF or your material on the cross members and place your clamps, you know, somewhere in the corner or towards the edge, um, as much out of the way as you can at first. And then uh, there's a couple different techniques to figure out where those clamps are in location to your G code. So the first operation you might choose to do is to tram your spindle, which is just a pocket operation. So um, it can be, you'll make it smaller than your MDF spoil board that you have uh, set up. And so you can see here Johnny Brook from Crafted Workshop is doing a tramming operation where he is, um, you know, squaring up the machine. Another pro tip here is you can see he accidentally cut through these clamps. So a pro tip is to use plastic clamps at first, um, but also to double check your toolpath operation to make sure it lifts to a safe Z height in between the cutting tools, right? Yeah. And one easy way to test that is to just put a two by four underneath your auto Z touch plate and touch off an inch and a half above your material. And so you can do an air cut. Right. Air passes are always great. Another way to do it, as uh, Nathan is showing us here in this video, is to jog your spindle over the clamp. And in the G code, when you have the G code loaded, you can see where the operations are and uh, where that uh, the tool is above the clamp. So that's another really great tip. Okay. Yeah, and going through our 10 step checklist, uh, even in the, these uh, uh, temporary spoil board, squaring, tramming, first project, you know, that 10 step checklist that we have is very helpful in that, making sure that, yeah, you're, you're clearing any work holding elements, whether it's clamps or fasteners, and you're gonna have a successful cut. Right. So uh, yeah, just some quick uh, pros and cons of using the clamps is it's a really quick setup. Um, it, it isn't a very good long-term solution if you want to leave your temporary spoil board set up for you know a week, say for example. Um, I think uh, this is a really good you know afternoon type of operation. Um, it also uh, the clamps do take up work area, right? As you saw, we were, we cut through them so. An alternative would to be use uh, to use the double-sided tape, um, which can be very strong adhesive and um, you know last you a short period of time uh, while you're still working on your final spoil spoil board design. Um, I think that the uh, you know best use I've seen is using the double-sided tape in a benchtop uh, pro uh, setup because you have the aluminum extrusion right beneath it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and so, Sammy, do you like to use the bar style clamps or the F style? Or I guess if you were going to pick a perfect clamp for this, you know, because mm -hmm. woodworkers love clamps, right? And we love talking about them. I probably wouldn't pick a parallel clamp. That probably wouldn't be the clamp that I would choose just because of cost and, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of high density metals in, in that clamp. So when you say plastic clamp, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so there's those uh, F clamps are really great. The uh, metal clamps are 
absolutely fine. I've, I honestly have cut through them once or twice and uh, that survived. Not that I recommend that. Um, but the quick clamps, um, you know, where it kind of has a, a squeeze actuation, you know, it, it tightens uh, with the, the quick clamp. I can't remember. I think that's the brand name. Um, so those are a really great option as well because if you accidentally cut through them, it's um, no big deal, you know, it happens to everyone and it's a good lesson to learn how to avoid that, right? Yeah. So, cool. okay. Do you have a, a thought on that? No. No, I think that's, that's, that's a great recommendation. Awesome. So next we have a uh, recommendation through uh, Jay Bates, and this is the uh, two by fours bolted to the machine frame. So you can see here, he also did the quick setup with the uh, spoil board, temporary spoil board clamped to the extrusion. Um, but here he kind of came up with an alternative where he ended up using this in his final spoil board approach as well. Um, but this is the, uh, he's bolting the, using the same T-nuts, he used it for the spoil board as if you were going to attach it to the top of the extrusion, but he's attaching two by four strips horizontally in parallel with the, uh, the cross members. Right. Yeah, so he's using the same fasteners that are included in your spoil board kit to attach these two by fours to those cross members. And he's using a small little section of the two by four here as an example. Um, but you can see here, he's bolting that to the frame and now he has a, a, a wood surface to attach his, his temporary or in his case, permanent spoil board uh, to instead of attaching that spoil board to the aluminum cross member directly. Right. Um, and you can see these are the longer strips that he ended up attaching. Um, I see uh, Draw, you're asking if we have a fixer program in Fusion. We do have a VCAR file for our um, spoil board files, and uh, we do have one in Fusion as well, and I'll show you those in a little bit. So we now I just want to pull up and sh uh, show you our uh, oh, accidentally opened slicer. We don't want to do that. <laughs> um, I have a VCAR file I'd like to share with you. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, you showed this to me earlier, Sammy, so I know what you're going to pull up here. And this is a great little example of, it's a good first project to do on that temporary spoil board with those clamps, right? And so uh, uh, we, we got the machine set up, we got that temporary spoil board cl clamped to our machine bed, and now we're going to create these uh, 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 two by fours to give us that, that wood cross member rather than just the aluminum cross member. Right. And so if you can see this box I just drew here is, you know, a uh, a bounding box that might be the approximate scale of that scrap piece you've just clamped to your cross members here. And this is uh, perhaps where you will locate your 2x4. Uh, and the operations here that we have, uh, I've just adapted these slightly from our uh, the flat spoil board surface into these um, parts that you can mount on the side. So here we have a counter bore operation which will allow the head of the screw to sit into the two by four. And then we have a mounting slot here. So instead of the mounting slots going left to right, I really want to be able to adjust the height of the two by four up and down uh, so that I can make sure that this uh, joined edge, which I have another prof interior profile here. So this will clean up and square up this edge here in parallel to my two mounting holes. So I'll be able to adjust that joint, jointed flat edge to the surface of the cross members so that I can really easily make two of these and then attach them to the cross members, put on a scrap piece and screw down into that or screw from below. Right. Yeah. So this is, you know, you could also do this operation on a drill press or using other traditional woodworking tools. But again, if uh, you're, you're new to the machine, new to the CNC, these are the type of simple operations, low cost materials that I always encourage people, hey, let's practice with low cost materials, low cost tooling, let's get the workflow down, and then let's really tune in the machine, dial in the machine to meet your needs. Right. 
And uh, yeah, the draw to answer your question, fixture programming meaning showing where the clamps are so the spindle avoids any fixtures, right? So Fusion has that capability. Um, we're, perhaps let's do that uh, deep dive in the future because I think that would be really relevant to our rotary, for example. So making sure to that Fusion can know where uh, the holding fixture is or the vise is or the clamps are. Um, in order to avoid those, V-Carve un unfortunately can't tell where your clamps are, so you just visually draw them out and drive your spindle around in the uh, preview window in Mach 4, and that, and that really does the trick too, so. Yeah. Um, here we go. So I, we just showed you this a VCAR file, and so that's really the approach I think for the temporary spoil boards. Um, do you have any last thoughts on on the temporary spoil board approach, Corey? Uh, I guess my last thought is, you know, temporary can mean a lot of different things for different people, and so I really want you to think about temporary not as like a one project spoil board, but maybe it's the first week, the first month of your machine you're using a temporary spoil board, and. Uh, you know, uh, this really is personal preference. This really is your particular uh, stage of CNC operation, right? If you're new to CNC, we don't need to rush past this step. We can kind of really lean into this temporary spoil board and learn more about our workflow and our toolpath creation and loading and operating and double checking uh, the, uh, all of the 10 step checklist items. And so maybe it's a day, maybe it's a single project, or maybe it's it's longer than that. And really, that temporary uh, aspect of the spoil board should really be set on on your comfort with the machine, and then your preferences for the work that you're going to be doing. Right. Um, there's a lot of folks who don't even have spoil spoil boards. For example, uh, Canadian Woodworks Legacy Lumber. They just set their slabs on uh, their cross members directly. And when they need to do sheet goods, they will mount a surface beneath that, uh, you know, temporarily and put it on and off as they need it. And it's not necessarily just a getting started guide, right? Um, yeah. Kevin, to answer your question, who should I call for a Mach 4, uh, for a Mach 4 problem? Uh, feel free to reach out to our support team at support at avidcnc.com um, and they will be happy to set up a call with you. Um, also, Gary asks uh, about, uh, Corey, I guess you mentioned um, how uh, to keep and make the, the J Bates approach uh, more secure. Um, we're going to get into dive, deep dive into J Bates's approach a little bit later, so stay tuned and hopefully we'll answer your question when we get there. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the most common spoil board features. Of course, this isn't going to be every single feature uh, ever included in a spoil board, but I think these are, you know, common ones that uh, you'll likely reach for depending on your workflow. Um, we'll try to touch on if a specific workflow uh, might benefit from these specific selections, right? So the first, uh, one of the first decisions you have to make when making your spoil board is what material am, am I going to make it out of? Uh, what is that base material? So two very common approaches are uh, making out of MDF or sheet goods or making out of HDPE, which is another really great choice. So let's kind of go into why one is a little bit different than the other. So MDF is probably the most common that I've seen out there. Um, it's really easy to machine, it's cost effective, it's really easy to refurbish later on, um, and it really offers a great variety of work holding, uh, clamping fixtures, and other options. Um, you can always add on a uh, vacuum table using MDF. Um, so there's a couple different approaches there, right? Yeah, there's also different densities, and so there's high density, MDF is medium density, there's also low density, which is used a lot in those vacuum tables as, as actually a material to pass the vacuum uh, pressure through, and so yeah, this is a, a great material. It also has some downsides though, it creates very fine dust, and uh, it can be kind of awkward to move around because it's pretty heavy. Right. Um, someone was just asking about how high do you leave the 2x4s? above the cross member. 
I guess this really depends on your goal. I would personally place them flush with the cross members so that when I put my sheet of MTF or HDPE that I'm bolting into those two by fours, um, I'm a really able to uh, distribute that weight, not just on those two by fours, but also on the cross members. Um, I could see some benefit in raising it uh, higher above the cross members, but that really depends on your goal. Yeah, I think if we're using that technique for a temporary spoil board, I think you're exactly right, Sammy. I think having them flush to the machine cross members, so when that temporary spoil board is, is sitting on the machine, we have more uh, surface area that it's resting on, and that 2 by 4 can't necessarily uh, uh, shift down uh, in that slot. Right. So the other uh, very common material that we see out there is HDPE as a spoil board surface option. Um, this really does give some other benefits. Um, it's more stable in terms of not being as susceptible to temperature fluctuations. It doesn't quite move like wood, you know, where wood will expand and contract uh, depending on the humidity and the temperature and uh, your environmental conditions. So, uh, for example, Dark Arrow, if you guys have seen our interview or their channel, they are making aircrafts, high precision aircrafts. So they prefer the HDPE approach because it really allows them um, to have a spoil board that won't fluctuate as much, especially since they are in um, Wisconsin. So they are uh, a little bit more susceptible to high temperature fluctuations winter to summer, right? Um, it yeah. is, and, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, and, and if you ever wanna use any type of cutting fluid or, mm -hmm. or there's moisture, MDF and moisture really don't get along. Yeah. And so if you know that's going to be the case. And I think part of that Dark Arrow's decision was uh, they wanted to, the option of using a, a mist, uh, a mister for their cutting fluid that HDPE really was the best material for them. Right. And uh, HDPE is also a very, um, it's far more expensive than a sheet of MDF. And right, the draw mentioned, it is also very heavy. So uh, these are both heavy materials, which in this case is, um, a good thing, you know, you want to add that weight added structure to the frame. Um, so it does add that uh, additional strength. Um, and right, as Corey's mentioning, it's really great for multiple different kinds of material setups. Uh, you're able to use, you know, something like a mist or uh, cutting fluids with it as well. So yeah, and with the, the HDPE, they make a lot of different thicknesses of that material. I probably personally wouldn't use anything less than three quarters of an inch thick mm -hmm. in the HDPE. So they do make quarter inch thick sheets of HDPE, but I really don't think that that's going to be structurally strong right. enough to make a great spoil board. Yeah, it will. that will definitely have some twist here. You can see in the reference image we have, it is thinner than the... Uh, you know, than a three quarter inch sheet, but this is a Benchtop Pro machine, which has a complete bed of uh, aluminum extrusion across it. Um, mm -hmm. And that really allows to uh, give support strength versus on the Pro machines where the weight distribution is across uh, the cross members, right? They're distributed. Um, so you want the thicker material for that format. Um, and you can see here, this is where we had set up at Maker Faire uh, 2019, uh, cutting some parts for our uh, crossbows uh, launchers. And um, it was in a uh, slight enclosure. We had uh, a fluid going. It was a very tidy uh, setup. And, you know, it's really, I think HTP is really good for things like uh, threaded inserts um, and having kind of set locations for specific types of setups. Um, it's not as flexible in terms of being able to on the fly just bolt something to it. You can screw into it, um, but it doesn't quite heal back the same way that MDF does. Um, MDF, you also are able to use the nylon nail gun, which uh, if you have an Omer nail gun, I know you might uh, love it because I love it. It's probably one of the uh, quickest works uh, workpiece setups, work holding approach um, out there, especially for sheet goods and plywood and that sort of thing. So uh, I do like that approach in terms of using MDF, right? 
Yeah. Um, and MDF is really, you know, you can glue on other layers. I really like having a thick spoil board. The thicker the spoil board, the more times you can level it. And the more times you can level it, the longer it lasts. So it, depending on your preferred approach to how you like to treat your spoil board, you know, if you're um, a really uh, high production shop and you're not, you don't care too much about the, how the spoil board is, is being treated, um, because you're just going to switch it out every month really quick, um, then that is, you know, that approach is very similar to Izzy Swan, for example. He is cranking out thousands and thousands and thousands of parts. Um, so his spoil board, he doesn't like to worry about preserving it over uh, long periods of time uh, where uh, I'm a small shop, I only have one person, and I don't want to have to, you know, try to get a bunch of friends to help me move big sheets of um, MDF spoil board that often, right? Um, so do consider those factors. Yeah, and again, that comes down to personal preference. Mm -hmm. Do you want to be replacing the spoil board often and just uh, uh, being really aggressive with your programming and, and uh, cutting all the way through your materials is, is critical and, and, uh, and that's your approach? Or do you want to have a spoil board that uh, has, has a longer lifespan? Right. Definitely lots of personal decision making depending on your shop needs and your uh, workflow. So Jonathan asks, um, disregarding wear on the MDF spoil board, how often you suggest facing a spoil board um, when you think about the swelling of the MDF due to environmental influences? Right, I guess it depends on your environment. Um, if you're in a drier, you know, temperature, uh, level place, uh, probably not that often. Um, I, I guess it really depends on, yeah, your location. I usually surface my spoil board once a quarter. Um, I think that's a good maybe place to start. Um, and I only just shave off, you know, it depends on, you know, less than a sixteenth of an inch, depending on how much, you know, somebody's accidentally cut into the spoil board, right? And then that, that does come into uh, wear on the surface. So, Corey, what do you think about how often, depending on environmental influence? Yeah, I think that, you know, there's uh, maybe some testing that you could do. So whether you have a long level or even if you do that programmically where uh, uh, you take some strategic uh, uh, drilling or, or peck drilling uh, into your spoil board and then you take a pair of calipers and measure it, right? And if you're getting the same depth uh, from the top surface down to the bottom of that uh, a peck drill, you know that your your surface is, is rather uniform still. And so I think that really, you know, when we talk about these specific environmental things, I think it comes down to what are your desired or required tolerances, right? And I think that's something that, you know, uh, these machines are infinitely tunable, right? But do we need to, to tune it to that level? Um, do we need to surface our spoil board every time we use it? No. Should we surface it once a quarter? I, I think that's that's probably a fair place to start if you require tight tolerances. If you're cutting all the way through sheet goods using compression tools and you can essentially always program a sixteenth of an inch through your sheet good into your spoil board, well, in that instance, I'm less concerned about environmental changes because chances are that sheet good isn't going to expand a sixteenth of an inch. Right. Good point. So, uh, Sammy, in your shop, I don't think that you have the humidity swings like in some other areas uh, mm -hmm. that where people have shops. But I do know that you're not necessarily in a climate controlled area where you have consistent climate all the time. Mm -hmm. And so, so you you doing it once a quarter. Uh, uh, but if your shop was climate controlled and and really stable, do you think that you would do it once a quarter if you had to? I think that. If I, if, if we were disregarding wear, uh, if it wasn't a climate controlled area, I don't think I would even do it that often. Um, I do think that wear on the surface of this spoil board ends up to come into play before any kind of serious fluctuation in the thickness of MDF, um, depending on environmental causes. Um, yeah, the shop that I'm working out of is a kind of basement garage, so it's cold because of the cement walls, but it uh, also it has a heater in the space, which means when I turn the heater on, it warms it up. 
and then when I turn it off, it'll cool off for a couple days. So there is that temperature fluctuation I should be aware of. Um, but I don't think it's, it's, I think it's within my tolerance. So it depends on what your tolerance is, um, where if you're so concerned about that fluctuation that often, you know, maybe going to the HDPE is a better choice. Um, although it is, you know, you have to weigh those pros and cons to see what is um, really, yeah, the right fit based on what you're trying to accomplish. So if you're trying to make precision aircrafts, HTPE is probably a good fit. If you're making plywood furniture or hardwood furniture, likelihood the MDF uh, subtle fluctuation won't, um, you know, will be negligible. Yeah. Um, so on to uh, clamping affordance features. So what do I mean by affordance? Um, it's really the ability or ability to do something. So when there is a, a door, it allows us the ability to walk through from one space to another space and to transition. So um, our ability to have different types of clamping um, here. So uh, we have one feature that's called, you know, called the clamping holes. So the through holes to um, mount something like an F clamp or a quick clamp through the spoil board. It's kind of so it sticks beneath the work surface. Um, we'll show uh, some images of each of these so you can kind of get a better idea. We also have T slots and T slots come in all shapes and forms. So first we have the aluminum extrusion T track. So for example, the Benchtop Pro has this kind of built in. You're able to mount clamps directly onto the frame of the machine. Uh, we also uh, are going to show you a little bit of Frank Howarth's approach, which is using a keyhole router bit to cut his own T-slots into the MDF spoil board. So this is a very DIY approach. But we also have uh, Jay Bates's approach, which is using a T-track kit. So uh, it's also like an extruded aluminum, but you'll um, attach it into your MDF spoil board. Um, and that's a very common, um, you know, he's definitely pioneered that uh, and lots of folks have picked up on it. Um, we also have, you know, different various aluminum work holding features. So when we're thinking about um, if we want to attach more T-Track for specific reasons or extrusion or plate, um, you know, having a vise and that sort of thing, uh, we do want to consider what would work best for depending on the materials you are machining. Yeah, all preference, right? When we talk about all these things, we're talking about your goals, your preference. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so the clamp through holes, I have since stopped using these on my as my personal selection, but I do really understand why you would like to use them. I love to use the um, clamps through clamps because on, on pieces that I know I'm machining in the center of the material. I know I'm not going to be machining on the corners. Um, so I'm just doing a detailed art piece here, you know, and the clamps can just go underneath the spoil board. Um, the things I don't love about it is I have to go underneath the machine to hook it through. Um, it can be a little bit tricky to finagle the uh, clamps in. Um, and right, it does kind of put the clamp over over the surface. Uh, the other thing is that the through holes allow dust to fall through um, into onto underneath your machine. Um, one person who does use this extensively but does it really well because of his setup is JD from Rainfall Projects, and I'll show a couple of his um, kind of jigs and setups later. But um, he does like to use these clamps approach because he's. Uh, his machine is set up in a barn on a farm and there's just piles of sawdust everywhere anyway so it doesn't really matter to him that it's falling through um, so that workflow works for him right yeah one pro tip with this is to set your XY datum in the center of your work rather than the lower left hand corner of your material and so if you can zero to the center of your work here uh, generally speaking mm -hmm. when you start and finish your program you're you're not going to have your machine rushing to where your clamp is right. connecting the material to your spoil board and so if you can get the center of your work datum rather than than a corner of your work datum it's it's really helpful in this application right 
So we also have a aluminum tea track here. So this is just an example of how you might slide in a, a Rockler um, clamp um, into the tea track on your benchtop machine. This is just uh, from my the machine behind me here. Um, and it's a similar consideration of the uh, previous one where you have this, the clamps on top of your surface. And as Corey was saying, um, you know, perhaps zero to the center. Um, think about, uh, you know, jogging your spindle around and using, utilizing that preview window. Um, I am definitely going to have to make a pro tip video about how to do that uh, soon, um, yeah. considering how much we talked yeah, about no. it today. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And, and when also, you know, in that preview window, if you change your, your G54 or your offset since you loaded the G code, mm -hmm. you also need to regenerate that toolpath. And so I think that's a great idea, Sammy, to do a, a pro tip video on that specifically. Mm -hmm. Someone also, um, oh, uh, the draw you mentioned, Rich Light, which I love as a material, Rich Light and Volcromat. Um, there's so many really good alternative materials. Like, I think Rich Light is a, can I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it is a recycled material. Um, it's kind of a compressed paper, which is, you know, similar to um, an MDF approach. Um, and you can get it in different colors and that sort of thing. So that's always fun. So. Yeah. Um, this is the uh, keyhole T-slot, so this is the DIY version uh, that Frank Howarth has a video all about, linked in the description below. Um, he uses this approach. Um, he, you can place the T-tracks very strategically. You don't have to, or sorry, I should say the T-slots because it's, it's uh, not a physical track, but um, he can place them around so you can enter the clamp at different points instead of just on the ends of the spoil board. Um, so he has uh, uh, some really clever ways how he approaches this. You can see his homemade uh, clamps here as well, right? So I like the, the cost-effective, thoughtful DIY approach um, because sometimes you don't need to make that huge investment in all of those T-tracks and this is a really great alternative. Yeah, or maybe you start with this and then you verify that, hey, mm -hmm. I really like using uh, uh, this type of clamping mechanism on my machine. It's very helpful for me. And then mm -hmm. you can go to the next step and invest in an aluminum version of that clamping me mechanism. Right. And all you would do is, um, you know, pock out those slots that you already had existing and then screw in the new ones. So you don't necessarily have to flip out the whole structure. Yep. So different ways to align your workpiece to your machine. So this is uh, another important function of a spoil board is so that when you put your machine or put your workpiece on your machine, you're not putting it at an angle because you don't really know how your workpiece is in orientation to the squareness of your gantry and your machine. So uh, when you're machining your spoil board, um, after you have trammed and squared your machine, you know that all of those lines and all of those you know, holes or alignment pins, however you choose to approach it, are going to be square to your machine. So you can trust those as reference points when setting up your material. Yeah, I've seen a lot of different approaches here. Uh, I've seen customers use V-bits and create a grid at different sizes, and that size should be based on increments that make sense for your work. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen Jade use these aluminum bench dogs. Uh, I've also seen people use wooden dowels. Uh, uh, I've seen people use dominoes. I've seen uh, Tim Sway use pencils for this type of work. Um, and yeah. you know, there's there's lots of different ways that you can align material to your spoil board. And I think this is exceptionally helpful, uh, uh, especially if you're zeroing to the center of your work because you can know where the corner of that work is based on those alignment points. Mm -hmm. One of the great things about, uh, yeah, Jay uses the bench dogs, which is not my preference. Um, I actually prefer using wooden dowels because I know if I accidentally cut into it, uh, there's a uh, lower risk there. Uh, but bench dogs are a big part of his workflow. So if you're kind of a traditional woodworker at your workbench and use these fairly often, it might feel uh, more intuitive for you. Um, he also has uh, set out alignments for those bench dogs so that he can place out multiples and do arrays of work. Um, and we'll, we'll show another clip of this in, in a moment here. Um, the dowel pins, uh, I actually don't have a uh, dowel in this 
image here, but this is from my bench shop machine. You can see that there are a quarter inch hole just uh, north of the, uh, the mounting hole there where I would put my Dell pins and then bump my workpiece up against. I also have um, on this machine experimented with, with using the V-Carve uh, grid and I actually really do enjoy this and um, because I'm just trying to quickly set up a piece of material, cut uh, some shape out of um, that plywood and I'm not too overly concerned about having it be perfect um, and you know with your eyes are, are a very strong tool and very accurate um, it, you know you want to trust trust them you know it's it's within a certain tolerance um, but uh, if it, depending on your project it probably is uh, fine right yeah so Sammy what uh, type of v-bit would you use there and how deep would mm -hmm. you cut if you were going to use a v-bit to make a grid yeah so I used you do have to consider um, the fact that when you're doing a v-bit it's going to the center of that groove is uh, the the line that you drew on so you don't necessarily want you have to know exactly how deep it's going so you can reference the top edge that bevel beveled corner uh, to put your material up against as you can see I've done here um, I preferred the 60 degree V a bit uh, just because it was a far sharper angle um, you can see the front channel I did deeper um, I was just this was you know my experiment in trying to figure out like oh I've seen folks do this let me just see um, because I want to fully understand how our customers are using the machine as well and I don't you know want to get too stuck in my ways of how I've done things for a long time so trying out those different techniques are um, you know really handy I think the uh, front groove was an eighth inch deep and the other ones were about a sixteenth inch deep um, so you can play around with those maybe do those on a scrap piece first decide what increments work best for you I think I did increments of one inch um, in the y direction and only did uh, you know uh, one horizontal one on the left um, or vertical yeah yeah no i think uh using that on a scrap piece on top of your spoil board initially and running a test especially if you're going to be uh, 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 really aggressive with the machine and so you're kind of adding a temporary spoil board on top of your permanent spoil board and then putting a grid on that and and really being able to execute on that is a great idea right um, I also saw Nickel CNC said a V group would be great for aligning four by eight sheets of plywood. Yes, absolutely. That's per a perfect example when you're just throwing sheets on and off. Um, another thing I did when I was working in a production shop and mostly using sheet goods is to have a permanent corner fence um, in order to just bump my material up against it and sometimes I would when I level my CNC machine I would just make a pocket that was offset half an inch from the origin point of that material of my corner so that I would always have a front edge that was parallel to the gantry and a left a vertical fence um, for the long side of my sheet good so I definitely would recommend you know having those kind of permanent fixtures or maybe you have um, a strip that has dowels that align, you can put it in and out as you need it. So a removable fence um, might work well as uh, well too. So other add-on fixtures you might uh, consider, you know, things like vices, uh, vertical work holding, which we're going to talk about a little bit um, in a second here, um, and then different kinds of custom jigs. So really, depending on the things that you're making, um, you're going to want to consider how you'll be able to mount these things to your spoil board. So a common one for uh, aluminum machining is to have a vise. Um, I really do appreciate uh, uh, Robert Cohen's approach to this. He likes to compartmentalize his spoil boards. So he has one section that's aluminum extrusion, um, one part that is a vise that's mounted in a dedicated location for that vise, and then he also has an MDF section for kind of more of a traditional spoil board. Um, so depending on uh, if you have that variety of workflows, maybe setting up those dedicated workspaces so you can easily transfer between each one rather than having to set up and square the vise every time you put it on and off, right? Uh, now, yeah, with, go ahead, Corey. with vices, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, you got to make sure you're accounting for the pressure you're putting on your material. Because if you create uh, a profile cut in that part, that vice is essentially going to, uh, uh, you know, crush crush your that crush your blank and and your work holding strength is going to deteriorate. And so vices can be tricky. So play play nice in the sandbox. Right. Uh, I see Gary's asking a question about plastic nails. So we have a uh, nail gun that shoots um, these composite nails. So what's really great about those is that you can machine through them without worrying about damaging your router bit. Um, let's see, I actually have mine right here. Yeah, so you can machine through them. Uh, uh, the other. The other thing is, is, is uh, uh, they have low shear strength, and so uh, after you've cut, if you hit the the edge of your material, they'll actually shear and break off, and so you can remove your sheet good um, without damaging your spoil board permanently. Yeah, let's see if we can get these out here. Yeah, so it does take a particular nail gun, and uh, that particular nail gun supports that composite nail all the way to delivery into your material. If you try to use these nails with other nail guns, they don't have that support, and the nail is essentially explodes as soon as the hammer is contacting the nail head. And I should also mention that our work holding playlist, which has you know short videos on all sorts of work holding techniques, is also linked in the description below. Below, and we have a video all about the Omer nail gun. Um, okay, so next we have uh, custom jigs. So right, this is really depending on what you're doing if you're making thousands of a part or even just one thing, you will really want to be able to consider how you're attaching that jig to your machine and how you're going to uh, be able to operate around it. So the uh, fusion feature that um, the draw you, Alexander was mentioning earlier was um, that you can program fusion to know where your fixture is and so it only machines your workpiece. So for example, these are uh, little speaker cases uh, that we made for, uh, I think it was Autodesk University, um, maybe mm -hmm. five years ago. Um, so, you know, having to make thousands of those, you really want the setup to be super quick. And, and then also being able to have set up multiple jigs, um, maybe on multiple machines and that sort of thing, or be able to move them around as you need to. Yeah, and I, I do custom jigs for one-offs, mm -hmm. uh, typically in the sense of I create a pocket in a piece of scrap material that, that I can then locate my, my final workpiece to. And so that pocket allows for my material to have lateral uh, 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 resistance, and it also locates my material perfectly. And so I will make sometimes a custom jig just in the form of a pocket and a piece of scrap material, even for a one-off. Right. So another good example of that is uh, JD is really good at making these. Um, this is JD from Rainfall Projects. He makes these excellent uh, one-time use custom jigs because, I mean, well, I understand if you need uh, multiple 60-inch giant salad bowls. So I, I'll be impressed if he uses it again. Um, but, you know, knowing how you're going to uh, mount it, you can see here uh, he's using those uh, through clamps to hold down the jig. Um, so really depending on um, what works for you there. Um, I wanna say hi to Johnny uh, Builds and Alma, thanks so much for joining us. Y'all, it's really great that you're here. Check out their channels, they're amazing makers. Okay, so uh, vertical work holding. This is, you know, a really fun, technique and approach and it really opens up so many doors and uh, we're going to show two different examples of this uh, that would be Frank Howard um, and his is of course the very DIY approachable version and then there's also um, Jay Bates has his you know refined vertical work holding as well so we're going to go into those in a moment here. So let's talk about the Avid CNC spoil board project. So we have a project available uh, that, you know, for anyone who has one of our machines, or you can, you know, even if you don't, you can download the files just uh, fine. Um, I find that this project is a very, you know, low barrier to entry uh, sheet of MDF. Uh, we have the files available so you can turn on and off different features that 
uh, you prefer that work for you. Um, these are available in the different, you know, the most common machine sizes, four by two, you know, four by uh, four, four by eight, etc. Um, and you can easily adapt them for, you know, custom machine sizes. Um, the hardware also is included with your machine kit, so you will get this hardware uh, when you order a machine. Uh, let me show you. This is our spoil board uh, project page on our website. Um, we have the files available in uh, VCarve as well as in uh, Fusion. This is the yeah, 4x8 version. Um, and you, you can adapt those files as well um, if you're more Fusion savvy there. Um, and let me just bring up this VCarve file to show you. Yeah, and I think this is what we're trying to do here is is give give you an option if if you want to cut. But really, I, I want to encourage you to set up a temporary spoil board and figure out the type of work holding that you like to use, and then let your spoil board complement that work holding. Right? Spoil boards should complement the type of work holding and the type of work that you personally are doing. Right. So here is the spoil board file. Uh, and if I go to my layers tab here, I can turn it on and off these different features. So here is the clamping features because that's not something I prefer. I might turn those off. Um, you can also turn on and off the, um, let's see, locating features. So these are the dowel pin holes because I like to, pr I prefer wooden dowels. I might use those. And you can of course add anything you like if you like to add T-Track to these and that sort of thing. Um, these mounting holes are in alignment with our current um, cross member spacing. Great. So that's just a uh, introduction to our uh, spoil board files. Yeah, and again, this is a starting point. Make these your own. If you want to add additional features, you want to remove some of those features, um, you want to use a different style, uh, 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 please you know, have this be a starting point and make it your own. Mm -hmm. So let's just uh, talk about a few folks who have you know, spoil boards that really fit their particular needs. Um, I really do admire all of these guys and, um, you know, there's so many more that I wanted to bring up and, and show you as an example today, but to uh, keep it within our hour here, let's just go ahead and jump into it. Uh, we have uh, Johnny uh, from Crafted, Johnny Brooks from Crafted Workshop. Um, I really, this is, you know, the all out, every feature uh, kind of approach. Um, let me just go ahead and I have a little clip here to talk about um, his approach to setting up. He's got a, a vacuum um, to hold down materials, a vacuum hold down bed, uh, which you can see him demonstrating here. And yeah, he did a very in depth uh, uh, video on setting up this entire vacuum bed system and fixture that's linked below. And so uh, 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 we're not going to go over too many of those particular details, but for processing sheet goods, a vacuum table makes a ton of sense with the CNC machine. Right, especially cabinet making when you have large pieces that are not too many, you're not revealing too many um, spaces uh, when you are, you know, if you're cutting out series of, you know, thousands of parts from a sheet, it might not work as well as having uh, large sheets for cabinet making, for example. So you still want to weigh those things. Um, but let's just talk about the um, different um, features here for that he chose to go with and why. So the vacuum hold down is really great for cabinet making and great as for you saying the sheet goods in general. Um, he also has the kind of custom fixture with the T-Track that he can put on and off as he likes. So he doesn't have to have the T-Track there in the way all the time. Um, it is MDF, so if he does want to use the nylon nail gun, um, he can do that. I, I do remember that perhaps he did this for um, when mounting the uh, sheets of kind of more builder grade plywood that was too bowed for the vacuum to hold it down. So with the vacuum and a couple of those uh, nylon nails, they together worked really well. Mm -hmm. 
Um, he really does, you know, in terms of the options, he really wanted to be able to, you know, a approach many different types of projects um, and not be as limited by his work holding options. Um, it is more of an investment in time uh, in, and uh, cost, especially because of the, the vacuum pump, um, but it is, uh, you know, will definitely pay for itself in the long run, depending on um, how you utilize it, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and you know your material flatness is going to be really important with a vacuum system, and like Sammy mentioned, you know the size of your end products if you're cutting out profiles is going to be really important uh, to have success with a vacuum system. Right. Uh, so uh, one of the next people we want to talk about, we've already mentioned a couple times, Jay Bates. Um, he has a an excellent spoil board project video. It's a full walkthrough. You can purchase his file that he painstakingly made, um, and I, I really recommend um, this file. If you really find a lot of things in common with your approach um, and Jay's approach, um, then I, I really recommend this, this path. Um, here is his reel. Uh, so... Uh, there it's going. Um, so you can see he's got also his homemade clamps, but it's got the T-track slots. Um, he's doing a high repetition, um, lots of components for these custom uh, furniture pieces. And you can also see just a hint there in front, he's got his vertical work holding. Um, I really do like here, he was able to do repetitious, you know, arrayed parts here. You can see how he has so many different options to lay out these components um, depending on the specific shape or length or size of those um, parts, right? Yeah, he also is using spoil board as a strip rather than a full sheet. And so if you look at in between those uh, 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 red T-tracks, you know, those are all just strips of MDF. And so in the event that he does uh, uh, have one that needs to be replaced, uh, he doesn't have to replace the whole sheet. He can just replace the strip. Right. Um, okay, so this is uh, just a few notes on, on Jay's approach. I see someone's asking, um, please ask Jay how to access the file I don't see on his website. Okay, we'll, we'll follow up, you know. Um, if you don't follow his website already, then I do recommend um, checking it out. He has an excellent newsletter and um, he also is very responsive to emails as well. So um, in terms of his features, the vertical work holding, I love his, his work holding approach. There's a lot of versatility there. Um, it doesn't, it's not an articulating one. It's, it's 90 degrees, but you are able to put your uh, piece at 180 degrees rotation this way on the, on the um, X, Z plane, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. He also already has the T-Track, it's M MDF, uh, kind of the difference here that I would see uh, for between Johnny Brooks and Jay Bates' approach is that uh, Johnny has more surface area to use the nail gun where uh, you might miss those, you know, uh, the MDF because of the T-Track, but then also you have the T-Track there all the time with Jay's approach. So depending on what you prefer, um, if you're using um, more large sheet goods versus um, doing dozens of furniture parts, you know, maybe T-Track is better for you um, in that case. Uh, the bench dog approach, right, that's his personal preference. Um, he has many different options. And I do think that this is an extremely approachable project. Um, so it's less of an investment than the vacuum bed, but it really does still give you that same, a lot of flexibility and, and use of the, of the uh, um, approach to work holding, right? Yeah, and Jay reviews this in his detailed video, but one thing he always does is he actually runs his entire machine bed as his VCAR file. So when he loads his uh, CAD file to draw uh, his, his part and then to create his toolpaths, he actually has all of these locating features within that CAD file. So he's actually locating his part on his work table without a G54 offset. His machine zero is his work zero. And then he just places those vectors where he wants them on the table. Right. 
Um, I see some questions here, so we'll get to those at the at the end. I'm just going to work through this last bit here. So we, of course, have our Frank uh, Howarth uh, example here. He has pioneered so many different approaches uh, to machining. He's done things no one else has ever done, and uh, he really has taught me how to think beyond uh, the limitation of sheet goods in in CNC approach and uh, and that anyone can do it. I really uh, find his approach accessible and thoughtful and you know just so so much fun. So let's see if I well, maybe I didn't load that video there so I can go ahead and, and play it. Um, so you can see here he has his articulating um, homemade uh, vertical work holding bed that kind of goes up and down in uh, I guess the uh, Y yeah, on the Y and Z direction um, yep. and then he's able to rotate that part uh, which is a bowl um, and he has such a dynamic workflow where you can put the bowl on the machine on the lathe back on the machine on the lathe so it's really a big it's a part of the ecosystem here um, so I think it's it's super thoughtful how he, he gives himself the same amount of options um, uh, with this approach, right? Yeah, I just love how Frank leverages every tool in his shop to get towards this creative process that he, he has, right? And so whether it's a CNC machine or the table saw or his lathe, right? He's always trying to look at these tools as potential solutions towards this this vision of 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 you know his his final product and i think he really exposes some cnc machining practices that are kind of unique to get to that vision right so here's uh, all of kind of the bullet points of frank's spoil board approach diy t slots adjustable angle uh, vertical work holding um, the mdf base um, it, overall, the design is a really cost-effective DIY solution, combines really well with, uh, you know, the hardware that we offer uh, with your machine order, and it's really great for custom setups and very specific, unique projects. Um, he also has so many custom fixtures, you know, holding spheres to his machine, all sorts of things like that. So. Yeah, I think versatility, his, his approach really allows for a lot of versatility and it's a pretty low cost approach. Now, it is a little bit higher time investment in, uh, uh, in the sense that, you know, you got to set all that stuff up, but it's so versatile. Right. So let's just go ahead and uh, jump into some of these questions that we have here. Um, there's some good ones. Uh, Steel Blade Woodworks. Hey, Joey. Um, other than the bit set I've purchased with my machine, uh, what bits do you recommend purchasing uh, that I might need for wood? Um, new to CNC and any help would be great. Okay, so it this is such a big topic in terms of what bits are right for you, um, and it depends on what you're trying to uh, machine. Uh, the starter set that you likely uh, got is a really great place to kind of explore those things that you prefer. Um, if you really like using compression bits in terms of cutting uh, sheet goods and sheet products, uh, that's a really great place. If you're into V-bits, um, my I really love the insert V-bits um, so you can preserve the longevity of the life of the tool uh, but change out just the blades um, because you know, bits are consumables, right? So you want to be able to preserve that life over time. Um, so that's something I prefer for woodworking, for sign making and that sort of thing. Um, you know, uh, I guess that's, yeah, it's kind of maybe where I would start. Yeah, yeah, and really uh, explore what an upcut tool does, what a downcut tool does, what a compression does, because really the, the bit selection is part of your personal preferences. Uh, I'm always trying to think about chip load and chip evacuation. And so the tools I select usually promote both of those things, my, 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 my chip load and my technique for chip evacuation. But like Sammy said, you know, there's so many different tooling options and, and diameters and uh, uh, yeah, just options. Just start simple and, and learn what those different options uh, uh, do for your results and then, you know, uh, uh, expand your tooling catalog uh, 
uh, as you need it. I, I don't necessarily think you need to have this huge tooling catalog right in the beginning. I think that some, some classic simple profiles can get you started and then expose a need and then invest in a bit for that need because uh, you know, between 10 and $110 is, is kind of this tooling range uh, per tool. You know, uh, tooling can get really expensive if you try to invest in every tool you might need down the line all up, up front. Right, good points. So uh, Nickel CNC, can old time users use some of the newer example files without upgrading? So I, I, are you asking about if you have an older version of vCarve? Um, I will definitely, you know, I'm going to add a couple of links in the description below. They're not there right now, but hopefully by end of day, I will have a PDF kind of written out explanation of all the stuff we just talked about. Um, also the vCarve file for the two by four, um, mounting, uh, bar. Um, and we can also provide the DXF versions of the vCarve files. So if you have an older vCarve uh, version, then you can still use those files and import the uh, DXFs to make your own toolpaths. Um, that would also apply to uh, someone's question about if they can use um, that file with Fusion as well. So if you want to adapt it to Fusion, you can import the DXF. Yeah. No, I think that's a great, great strategy there. Um, let's see. Uh, someone had a question. Any thoughts about the vacuum puck systems for smaller parts? Is it worth the investment? Um, I am not sure that I know about that specific type of product, but I've seen custom smaller uh, vacuum holding systems. Um, you know, Winston Moy made one for his, um, I want to say it was a box uh, maybe it was a Pokemon ball mm -hmm. and it was a custom fixture for that. So you can make, you can certainly make your own custom, um, vacuum holding, uh, jigs for specific, very specific parts. There was no other way he would be able to machine it without that approach because he needed to machine the whole, uh, spherical surface. Um, and there was nowhere to hold it while doing that operation. Um, so I do think it's worth investment depending on right if you reveal the need for it. Yeah, vacuum pucks can be really effective. They can be perfect for certain applications. If you create airflow into the vacuum chamber of that puck, so if you uh, cut into that part, the puck is essentially going to be useless and your part's going to come free though. So it does have one downside, which is you cannot have any uh, uh, machining into that. And then also when working with materials like MDF, sometimes the vacuum uh, pressure that you can create in that puck is significantly lower because we can actually have air travel through that MDF. And so the vacuum pucks really, you want a denser material that is very flat in order for them to be exceptionally effective. Okay. Oh, Alice confirmed. Uh, Coat Duck confirmed the, was the Pokeball ring box. Yeah, epic, epic build. Um, yeah, Winston does great <laughs> stuff. Yeah, we can't, we can't inflate his ego too much here, you guys. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so we got um, another question here. Um, do you have a feel for the strength of Frank's MDF T-Track approach? Um, yeah, I've seen it in person. Right, The depth of how far down that T-Track goes uh, will depend, will influence the thickness of that um, support, right? Uh, I've seen, seen it in person. I've I've slid the bolts around in that and it's, um, works great. I mean, just considering how much he uses it, um, and seeing how long that spoil board has lasted and that, you know, I, I know he's a very honest, um, genuine storyteller. So if it, if it broke, he would, he would probably have told us, uh, by now. So I do think it was, um, it is a good approach, you know, but I also think he doesn't over torque it. Right. And I think that's what that question is really asking is like, uh, that door is open because it is just MDF and where uh, a, an aluminum T-Track, you know, you're going to have uh, less option to over torque it mm -hmm. because it's really going to be a lot stiffer. Right. And so perhaps you make your own custom T-Track with the um, inserts, uh, you know, getting a small sheet of HDB or hardwood and then insert those section in, into your uh, spoil board throughout. That could be another uh, DIY approach. Yeah. Um, 
Let's see. Do you know anyone who makes videos CNCing PVC boards? Um, I don't see many videos with that material. Um, I don't think I can think of anyone on the, off the top of my head, but send an email to support and we'll see if we can find, find a good reference for you. Uh, and we're always trying to uh, expand the uh, videos that we have here uh, helping folks learn about machining different materials so I definitely will put that on my list. Um, thanks uh, everyone for joining. Uh, we really uh, appreciated y'all being here today and uh, it was a really great conversation. This is a topic I'm really passionate about because I've gone through so many different versions of spoil boards and they really allow you to have different approaches and um, uh, ability to do different types of things. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, it was a really great talk. So thank you, Corey. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me, Sammy. And again, uh, uh, thank you everyone. We appreciate your support and this is a personal preference. And so if you're not sure uh, what you should do, reach out to our support team and we will do our best to help ask you questions about what you're trying to accomplish and then potentially nudge you in a direction that is a great solution, whether it be temporary or permanent. All right. All right. Uh, happy making and we'll see you in the shop. Bye.